today, first up, we will have House File 1030 by our own Representative and Chair Liebling. So we will move directly to the bill. We will, uh, for the motion, I believe, Representative Liebling is to lay this over for possible inclusion in the omnibus. That's correct, Mr. Chair. All right, when you are ready, please proceed. All right, well, good morning, members. Um, and uh, um, I am uh, bringing before you House File 1030. It's been on our agenda a couple of times and got kicked over, and hopefully um, we, can, we can do uh, this um, fairly quickly this morning. So House File 1030 is about cost barriers to health care. So I don't like to call it cost sharing because cost sharing, you kind of think of sitting down and sharing the cost of a meal with your friends. That's not what this is. This is barriers to health care. This is how insurance shifts costs to the consumer and often those costs are falling on the sickest consumers. Um, so I, I looked and tried to find some data on out-of-pocket costs for uh, people with health insurance. It isn't that easy to find really good information, um, but the Commonwealth Fund, which is a national organization, did some a recent survey and found that 43% of working adults are inadequately insured in 2022. Um, some were uninsured, some had been part uninsured for part of the year, and many, 23%, had coverage that didn't um, give them affordable access to health care. So these are national numbers. But there's also some data that shows that Minnesota has some of the highest out-of-pocket costs in the nation, well above the um, um, median for the country. So um, this is some information from the University of Minnesota that's showing that, and this might be a couple years out of date, I think it's 2022, also showing that um, the uh, Minnesota has the highest out-of-pocket spending in the nation. That's not how we think of ourselves. But what this out-of-pocket, these out-of-pocket costs do is set up a barrier to health care. Um, yes, they also possibly help reduce the cost of premiums so people can obtain health insurance. But when our constituents think about health care, they're not thinking about having insurance as much as they are thinking about having access to care that they can afford when they need it. And, um, and so that is really what this bill is meant to put a spotlight on. So the bill itself has different components. When I had this bill drafted, I think now a few years ago, I, I just asked to say, asked to um, let's have a bill that would remove out of pocket cost barriers for every kind of insurance that Minnesota has jurisdiction over. Because <laughs> I think that many of you know that we don't have jurisdiction over all health insurance. Um, we, the so-called ERISA plans, the self-insured plans, which are quite a bit of our health care um, in the state, we do not have control over. But there are many things that we do. And so this bill has different um, sections to it. And the first of them is getting rid of the out-of-pockets in our medical assistance program. And a, a medical assistance, as folks probably know, is for very low-income people. So I think it's up to 138% of the federal poverty level, generally speaking. So that's really low. And yet we have, in law, out-of-pockets that they are supposed to pay for various services. So the first thing that this does is to uh, eliminate those. And I'm going to pause on that point because this year, the Department of Human Services has included that proposal in its budget proposal that is going to be before this committee. So I'm, if, if I was a small part of making that happen, I'm really thrilled about it because this is something that really we should do. Because what we want is for people to go and get health care when they need it so that they hopefully improve their lives and hopefully head off more serious illnesses by getting care or by getting the medications that have been prescribed for them and not setting up barriers. So even these small dollar amounts can be barriers. So I have with me today Ann Bops from the department who is gonna speak a little bit about the department's 
um, proposal that is also in this bill. Thank you, Representative Liebling, and welcome to the committee, Ms. Bobst, and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members. Uh, for, for the record, my name is Ann Bopst. I'm with the Department of Human Services. Um, as Chair Liebling mentioned, uh, the provision to eliminate cost sharing in medical assistance in House File 1030 is included in the governor's budget. Uh, currently in medical assistance, some but not all enrollees are subject to cost sharing. Uh, children and pregnant women, for example, are exempt from cost sharing. Uh, in addition, many but not all of our services uh, have copays or a deductible applied to them. So for enrollees who are subject to copays, those copays can range from $1 to $3.50, depending on the service or prescription drug. Uh, the complexities in these copay policies can be confusing for enrollees and providers alike. Uh, providers are the ones who collect copays, however, they cannot withhold services from an enrollee if that enrollee is unable to pay. So the elimination of copays and medical assistance will help support low income families for whom these copays may be a financial burden. Um, and we look forward to continuing to work with the chair on this bill throughout the course of session. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pops. And we'll continue with your presentation. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm not going to say a lot more about the bill, um, except to say that um, I realize that this, it may not be um, entirely practical to just um, implement all that is in the bill, but it is really meant to start the discussion about the meaning of having cost barriers when people buy insurance, pay a lot of money often for premiums, and then still cannot get health care because they can't afford the out-of-pocket costs or they incur a lot of medical debt in spite of being insured, which is also something that, that happens quite a bit. But I think very importantly, if people have um, out-of-pocket costs they know they have to pay when they're going to go and get health care, it deters people from getting the care. If your child is sick in the middle of the night, and you, and you don't know what to do, and you're worried about your child, but you have to think, gee, am I going to be able to afford the copay? And what is my copay again? How much is this going to cost me? Am I going to be able to afford it? You may just decide to stay home with your sick child when you really ought to be taking the child into the emergency room. That's the kind of thing we want to prevent. And I'm going to stop there, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee, for the time. Thank you, Representative Liebling, Liebling, for the presentation. We'll go to testimony. We do have one person signed up, uh, Mr. Dan Andreessen, from the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. If you could take a seat and state your name for the record, please. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans, Trade Association for Minnesota's Nonprofit Insurance Plans. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, our opposition is just in Section 2 of the bill. Um, our members cover a majority of the individual and small group markets, uh, which will be impacted by the changes in Section 2. Um, and so my testimony will focus on what will happen if a federal waiver is approved um, to prohibit cost sharing in these markets. So one of the main roles of health insurance is to help our enrollees access health care by financing and spreading out the costs of their annual health care bills. Uh, these costs are paid in one of two ways, either through premium dollars that are paid monthly by the enrollee, which then the health plan uses to pay medical bills, or through co-pays or co-insurance, which are paid before or after a health care um, um, service by the enrollee directly to the provider. Now, plans create a variety of products that divide the enrollee's payments between premiums and cost sharing, so they have a, a variety of different options that they can choose from. And as established in the Affordable Care Act, products all products sale on the individual market must fall into one of four tiers. Um, as you'll see in the table in our handout on our letter here, uh, there's four tiers that um, all individual market plans have to fall into. Um, and these are set by, uh, or defined by a ratio of premiums to cost sharing paid by enrollees. And if cost sharing is prohibited, then all the products in these tiers will be eliminated and the only product available will be one that's 100% premium. Now, there's no language in the bill to lower the, the cost of health care. Um, if, if an enrollee is not paying their medical bills through cost sharing, the, the, the doctor is still charging you for that service. Um, so that money will then have to come through premiums. Um, and we expect those premiums are going to rise significantly. A single person could expect to pay $1,000 or more a month uh, in certain parts of the state 
and a family of four could be paying over $3,000 a month in premiums. And based on our experience, our, and, it, and they will have to pay this or go uninsured because choice has been eliminated. Um, the market's gonna go from four options to one. And based on our experience on platinum plans on the exchange, it's most likely that the 130,000 Minnesotans in the individual market will decide not to buy coverage. Initially, when the exchange began, some enrolled in platinum level plans. Platinum is a 90% premium, 10% cost sharing. But over time, fewer and fewer people purchased these plans because the premiums were so high. Eventually, no one bought these products and they haven't been on the exchange for the last five years. If platinum products were set at 90% premiums and Minnesotans couldn't afford that, how are they gonna afford 100% premiums? House File 1030, with, with, with uh, inclusion of Section 2, would lead to unaffordable insurance rates and increase in Minnesota's uninsured rate and lead to an end to the individual and small group markets. Rather than the approach suggested in Section 2, we'd urge the committee to work to develop policies to address the cost of care, which is the root cause of health care unaffordability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andreessen, for being here, and thank you for your testimony. <laughs> I just want to call out to the public if there are any other individuals who would like to testify, this would be the moment. Seeing no hands, we will uh, move to member questions and discussion. And Representative Carroll, you are first. Thank you. I just wanted to um, thank uh, the chair for bringing this bill forward. I have worked in this area uh, previous to my service here. I was with the Hennepin County Attorney's Office representing Metropolitan Health Plan, which is a public program's HMO. And I remember when this policy came through from DHS, the idea was to have enrollees have a little skin in the game and therefore value the care more. But we, what we found out, found out soon was that it actually ended up as a prohibition or is administratively difficult. Oftentimes health plans would just waive the, the, uh, the copay or the pharmacy or whatever, because it just wasn't worth the time and hassle to try to, to try to collect one or three dollars and deny people care. So I appreciate you bringing this forward and I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Representative Carroll. Any comment, Representative Liebling? Well, Mr. Chair, I think that's really all. We could just, I sure. think, lay over the bill. Or I think I see another question. But, sure. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, Representative Kwam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to, to the author and committee members. Um, I watched closely when we, PPACA, passed federally and the evolution, and I remember bragging about, not myself, but there were people and entities bragging about how low Minnesota premiums were. And you know me, I did the math, and I looked at cost of premiums, cost of out-of-pocket, and then looked at the co-pays. And when I compared to what was happening in other states, uh, the total cost wasn't better in Minnesota. It was just shifted from premiums to out-of-pocket and co-pays. Um, and that's why, you know, medical expenses are pretty high. And this bill has a good intent, but I don't see it lowering the effective cost. So we get rid of the out-of-pocket and that, we're gonna end up with a program that is premium-wise so expensive that we'll go back up and have more people uninsured because frankly, um, they see it as, you know, budget, budget-wise, cash flow wise better uh, to just bank and then pay for the uh, uh, medical expenses directly. Because I, over the last decade, I, I've heard a lot of that. I've heard a lot of people going to the cooperative medical because of the structure of, of some of these plans. So I, I understand the intent. I, I fear the reality would be detrimental. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Representative Kwam. Representative Akam. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to thank um, Chair Liebling for bringing this bill forward. The committee may remember that um, I have a, a bill 
removing cost sharing for breast cancer screening and um, it's that way because those um, high um, out-of-pocket costs can become a barrier to care and so I just really appreciate the broad scope that this has and um, the intent of the bill so thank you so much madam chair thank you representative Acom uh, representative Schumacher thank you mr. chair um, process question first uh, for the chair the bill is being laid over today uh, section 11 of the bill requires the Commissioner of Commerce to uh, require uh, request a waiver. Um, this also impacts our CEGA programs. Uh, will the Commerce Committee or State Government Committee be hearing this, this language at some point? Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Representative Schumacher, if the bill was going to move forward in its current form, then yes. But I'm not, we'll see if that happens. Thank you, Representative Liebling. Uh, Representative Nadu. Oh, sorry. Pass for you, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> I heard, heard new. <laughs> they always pass for me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I think this is an awful idea. And I just, I guess I want to go on the record talking about it. If we're talking about, you know, reducing a, a few bucks here and there on a copay, hey, no problem. But that's I, that's not what this that's not what I, I read this bill to be. I mean, this is going to you know eliminating cost sharing for you know all products offered on the individual and small markets for small businesses. I mean, it's truly going to drive costs up. I mean, uh, you know the platinum plans that were offered before that had the lowest the lowest copays. Nobody bought them because the premiums were too high. So. The idea here, I think, is fine. I mean, if we want to eliminate out of out of you know out of pocket costs for our MA populations, great. Let's figure out a way to do it. Let's get a fiscal note. Let's identify it, um, and and let's let's do that. But this 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 is almost it's on the edge of ridiculous. Um, you know, this will this will drive up our uninsurance rates. This will this will drive costs for consumers. It's cost prohibitive. It's it goes it goes the absolute opposite direction that Minnesota has gone forever to provide care in a cost effective way with our partners in from providers to health plans to every to everyone else. So I mean to be in favor of this, I mean this is a this is a massive increase in our in our health insurance premiums. Um, and I, I just, I just don't, I just don't understand why we're, why we're going here. If we're trying to solve some out-of-pocket <coughs> costs, expenses for our lowest-income people. Fantastic. Let's get there. This is far beyond that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nadu. We have uh, Representative Murphy, Bonner, and Ryer, and then we will go to closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I just make a couple comments. I think this is going to be terrible for small businesses and self-employed people. I come from that background. I can tell you my story. Uh, Ten years ago, um, it was a, a situation where I had a $10,000 deductible myself, and then uh, my, my cost for my premium was $3,000 a month. And that year, one of those years, I used it all. So before my first dollar of care, I had $46,000 out of my pocket for this. But this is going to destroy small businesses and self-employed people because that premium is going to go up. They're going to have to look for another option. We did. We went to a co-op sharing and, and removed ourselves from insurance. Um, but this is going to hurt small businesses and self-employed people a lot. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Murphy. Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I just want to say thank you to uh, Chair Liebling for bringing this bill forward. Um, you know, it's interesting that just within the last week, we saw some data out of the White House that said that during the pandemic when we had opened up ex and expanded uh, insurance coverage to more Americans, that within that time frame, we saw a steep decline in the reductions of, of medical debt across the country, which is one of the largest segments of U.S. debt. So I think that's really telling. And why it relates to this, and I think specifically, is that we have here a bill that talks about barriers to care and specifically preventative care. What we really know from the data on the ground, from the facts, and the health plans know this too, is that when we get access to preventative care, the overall cost goes down. 
And it goes down because people are not putting off critical care that they should be receiving, that they should be going to the doctor for, and waiting until it's too late when the ramifications of that care are significantly, or that condition are more acute, they are more costly to treat, and more challenging. And not only that, the bills get bigger, folks. When the bills get bigger and more people are suffering from medical debt, that does not help the system. It doesn't help insurance companies. And we talked about you know, the total cost of ownership. And I thank Representative Kwam for that because that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about shifting. And I can tell you, you know, for small businesses and for companies, and we talk about these bills or these items with the high deductibles, people are not going to get care because of high deductibles. That is not helping anyone when we don't go get care. I can tell you for decades, I put off care because the deductibles were so high. And small businesses, to be honest with you, I have a constituent who told me that their small business was paying 10 to $15,000 in deductibles on their high deductible plan for her and her husband. That is insane. I don't know how small businesses cont continue to operate if they have to spend $15,000 on receiving care. But specifically, this bill does a great deal to talk about MA. We are talking about people who have legitimate, real reasons to have barriers to care. We're talking a dollar here, three dollars there. In the grand scheme of things, in order to make sure that people are getting good preventative care and we can bring costs down, it is silly to be arguing over such small and minute amounts. So I wanna thank Chair Liebling for bringing this bill forward. And I am hopeful that this might bring, reduce barriers to care and get folks the preventative care that they need. Thank you, Representative Bonner. Uh, next, Representative Ryer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very briefly, uh, people talk about one to three to five dollar copays being small. I've been the person for whom that isn't the case. I've been the person on medical assistance who found that to be a significant barrier for me and for my small son at the time. Also, as a long-term researcher in the healthcare space, I have talked to many, many uh, small businesses, large businesses, individuals uh, who use healthcare and who purchase healthcare. And the consistent theme I hear and have heard for decades about small business is that the market does not serve them as it is, and the barriers to care are real. So I thank you for this. Thank you, Representative Ryer. Final words, Representative Lee. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, committee members. So a few things I would like to point out. Uh, first of all, um, you know, people talking about cost of care. You know, you can't do everything in one bill, right? Healthcare, as we all know, is very complicated. We do have to tackle the actual cost of care, but can't do everything in one bill. So this bill is not aimed at that underlying issue. Um, people take on the high, when people have to choose plans and they have to balance their out-of-pocket cost against the cost of the premium, oftentimes people with lower incomes are forced to take the cheaper plans. They're forced because they, they can't afford the high cost of the uh, premiums. And so they kind of bet that they're not going to need to spend a lot out of pockets. And unfortunately, sometimes they lose the bet. Hence, we've got all the medical debt and so on. Um, we do right now have the Biden subsidies. I want to remind people the cost of premiums is reduced under the Biden subsidies. So I think it's 8% of your income is the most on the exchange that you have to pay for premiums. So right now, at least, if the cost is shifted to premiums, that there is help with that. And I hope people listening realize that, that, that it has brought that down. But Minnesota still does have the highest out-of-pocket spending. So is it ridiculous to think that we should bring that down? I don't think it's at all ridiculous. Having, I think, was was um, Representative Murphy said $46,000 in out-of-pocket costs? That's outrageous. That should never happen to anyone. When you have insurance, that should never, ever happen. So, um, you know, um, I, I don't think it's ridiculous at all to think that we should find a better way 
to make sure that people can get actual health care? Having a, having a policy does you no good if you can't get health care when you need it. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would ask to have the bill laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Representative Liebling. We will take a very brief comment from Representative Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my comment to that is that the decision we had to made, make that year, um, when we had the, the uh, high deductible, or the low, de low deductible and high premium, because it was the cheapest way we could afford to stay in business. We had to pick the premium that we could actually, we could live with. And so what this is gonna do, in my opinion, is this is gonna drive those premiums up even higher and will force people out. And actually that's what happened to us. We, had to, we, we couldn't afford 46,000. I'm not bragging about the 46,000, no business can afford it. But that's what you're gonna do if you drop the, if you drop the options and we're gonna have higher premiums and that's gonna drive people out. Thank you, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Representative Liebling, for House File 1030 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus.